Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my honourable colleague for Jean Kier for splitting his time with me. We are in a terrible place now. When we were first getting used to the idea that we were in a pandemic and needed to um, adjourn Parliament, remember March 13th of 2020, we stood in this place, and some of us were physically present to say, well, by unanimous consent, we're going to adjourn till April 20th. And it seems absurd now, Mr. Speaker, but I, I clearly remember, as I said, the Greens give unanimous consent for this, that I thought, do we really need to stay out as long as till April 20th? That seems maybe a little extreme, but we'll see. We've learned a lot. We started talking about flattening the curve. We thought that would be adequate because we were told it would, but we learned more. This has been a very steep learning curve. And if we'd learned faster and gone faster and followed the models of countries like New Zealand, like Australia, like South Korea, uh, the countries that decided to go hard, go fast, the kind of advice that uh, World Health Organization, Dr. Michael um, uh, Ryan recommended back then, go hard, go fast, don't wait to be perfect. Um, speed trumps perfection. I thought we were going fast, and I certainly am not in, in the, at the level of someone who wants to start casting blame. I, I find this motion, this, this debate tonight difficult, because as much as there is blame to be cast, um, does it help? I don't want the people of Alberta to feel that the federal parliament has decided to lay into them with clubs. It is pretty clear that their premier miscalculated badly and cost people's lives. I, I want to reflect a bit on, on something that I don't think gets said enough in this place. That there's somehow this, I think there's a perception in Alberta that people like me who want to see the fossil fuel industry shut down, phased out over time and take care of the workers, that that somehow means we don't love Alberta. I really love Alberta and I love Albertans. And I am so, I have so much respect for the grit of Alberta in facing major disasters. And I, I remember very clearly, of course, the, the 2013 floods in Calgary. I went, I pulled uh, rotted debris from people's basements in High River because I found myself in the days after the 2013 flood in Calgary for Stampede and just thought I can be more useful if I got a friend and we went up to High River and see if we could help. But I remember that I've got the T-shirt, right? <laughs> Come hell or high water. And Mayor Nenshi deciding, even though it looks impossible to have stampede, we're going to do it. I admire that spirit. And again, so soon thereafter, the 2016 uh, fires through Fort McMurray, the incredible community spirit, the not leaving anyone behind. I mean, that's a, it's a very strong image of the patient and orderly evacuation with fires on all sides and 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 the residents of Fort McMurray moving out along the single road and if somebody's car ran out of gas they got into somebody else's car it, it's inspiring and now for Alberta to be the site of the highest COVID rates in North America is is devastatingly frightening because we know more about this pandemic now we know about this virus. We know the longer the virus lives among us, the more likely we are in a human Petri dish to have more dangerous variants. We don't know yet if it's all about getting vaccines in case a variant overcomes a vaccine. We are in a very dangerous place, this third wave. We're also today in a day to mark Red Dress Day to think about and to pledge solidarity with all of the families of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. It was early June, two years ago, that this government was delivered onto it, the report of the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirited peoples. One of those key recommendations was to shut down the man camps. Now, at that point, the threat to human life from what was called man camps in the inquiry, but to many Canadians, they might not know the term, but, but large construction sites, that they represent a threat to the vulnerable, to the marginalized who have to hitchhike. And I know there was a very strong reaction from people in Alberta. And of course, 
most of the workers are the dads and the granddads and the brothers and the sons and thoroughly decent people. But there's no question but that the evidence shows that missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls are at more risk when there are transient camps of workers. So in COVID, I just want to ask the question, why is it that we decided, we, public health officials and governments, that when other things had to close down, like mom and pop shops and various um, places where people might have been able to be actually better off than in a concentrated place like a work camp, the work camps were decided to be so essential that we couldn't shut them down. The highest rates of COVID in Alberta right now are in the region of the oil sands, very high rates. And in British Columbia, the NDP government in British Columbia has decided Site C, Site C is so important to continue that we, we wouldn't possibly think of shutting it down when it has outbreaks. We have outbreaks right now at the Site C dam site, the Kitimat LNG facilities that are being built along the Trans Mountain Pipeline construction, like the coastal gas link. Right? All the man camps turn out to also be places where COVID flourishes. And one of the key things about the oil sands is the workers commute by airplane. So think of poor Newfoundland and Labrador, where they were in the Atlantic bubble, felt that the rates were low enough to meet the requirement under Newfoundland and Labrador law that new Premier Andrew Fury had to call an election within a few months. And suddenly they had an outbreak of COVID from the oil sands workers. And they're having them now. And if you read the, if you search this, you'll find it everywhere that, that academics and scientists are saying, we've got a problem. We have these fly in, fly out camps. One expert said, you know, COVID didn't just walk in here by itself. It showed up on an airplane. So while we worry about international borders and why we're not being tighter with our borders, how is it that we are so addicted to oil that we turn a blind eye to the impact of these work camps, of these man camps, that we should have been shutting down or at least ensuring that the workforce there was not commuting back and forth across many provincial borders. There were ways perhaps to keep people in the construction industry working when many other industries were shut down, but we've turned a blind eye to the fact that it's the workplaces that overwhelmingly squashed busy workplaces, places like slaughterhouses, that we've shut down parts of our economy, but turned a blind eye to the places that seem to me, in reviewing the evidence, to be the places where COVID flourishes. We've, we've seen the mayor of Lethbridge say, and Chris Spearman, quote, we have done the least of the provinces. We've tolerated protests against masks and at the hospital and rapid vaccination clinic. We need to do more. One of the Albertans I admire the most, I suppose, because he's brilliant, is journalist Andrew Nikiforic, who wrote a piece just a few days ago in the TIE titled A, Corona, Coronavi a Coronavirus Hell of Kenny's Own Making. I only mentioned the title so you can look it up. But what he said was, quote, the numbers reflect first and foremost Premier Jason Kenny's callous and persistent disregard for scientific findings and mathematical reality. Close quote. One of those mathematical realities is exponential growth. Alberta's in a dangerous place right now, and it's certainly not the fault of Albertans. We had a government in Alberta that over Christmas had a fairly significant proportion of its elected uh, provincial leadership decide it was okay to go on a vacation. And as I dug into it, as one of the ministers excused herself by saying, well, I wanted to make sure I was helping the airlines in this economic crisis. And I thought it was a facetious comment that wouldn't land well. But then I read further and found that actually the premier had thought that this was a good way to help WestJet, that there'd be kind of safety on a Alberta to Hawaii corridor that could somehow live outside the reality of COVID. There were problems in leadership. There were problems of not leading by example. There were problems in not wanting to address the science of COVID by allowing the policies to be ideological. None of us can let this be ideological. We have to set aside whatever partisanship we bring to this and end up where Andrew Nikiforic's article ended, which was this, quote, it's time to pray for Alberta, close quote. And I will also note that faith by itself doesn't do the work. 
we need to do the work to help Alberta and Albertans in any way we can. Thank you. Questions and comments? Question and comment, the Honourable Member for Central Nova. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my friend and colleague for her remarks and, and let me add my voice to those who are thinking of Alberta uh, during these most recent outbreaks. Having spent five years of my life there, including during 2013, when I was personally evacuated, I saw firsthand uh, what a good neighbour looks like. Uh, there's hardly a person I know that wasn't picking up scrap from their neighbour's yard, making sure they had groceries and were taken care of. But I got to say, during this debate, I, I, I sit here stunned. Um, living in Nova Scotia, you know, they say sometimes uh, where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, we've had the benefit of a thoughtful pandemic response from a public health point of view. We are in a lockdown now after we've seen our cases go into double digits and now uh, triple digits for a few days. Uh, and the collective response here has been one of acceptance because we know that the option is not between a lockdown or not a lockdown. The option is between having a short and serious lockdown or a lengthy and drawn out lockdown. Those who have studied pandemic responses around the world have seen during COVID-19, the jurisdictions that have embraced a strict and swift lockdown have seen a lesser impact on their economy, a lesser impact on their public's health and a lesser restriction on their civil liberties. I'm curious if the member can offer commentary on the importance of following the epidemiological research and science to understand that we need to be neighborly once again and need to support Albertans with financial supports federally and provincially to ensure that they can afford to do the right thing and stay home. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Well, my honourable colleague, the Parliamentary Secretary, came awfully close to his former Premier's famous stay the blazes home. But I'm astonished in this country that we don't, don't even learn within the boundaries of Canada what's working and what isn't. Um, the Atlantic bubble was an extraordinary success of, as, as the honourable member said, evidence-based decision-making and strong instructions for people to stay home and then to be able to create an Atlantic bubble so that Newfoundland, so that, you know, that uh, Brit New, New Brunswickers could, could, could drive to PEI and Prince Edward Islanders could get to Nova Scotia. The, the case rates in the Atlantic bubble were, are compared to Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, and now Alberta, a, a real success story, and I certainly hope that for Nova Scotians' sake, that this recent spike is and in New Brunswick is quelled very quickly. Questions and comments? Question and comment, the Honourable Member for St. Albert's Edmonton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Uh, in an earlier intervention, the Honourable Member spoke about the UK. And uh, it should be noted that the UK has had some of the most uh, restrictive measures in Europe, yet has fared much worse uh, than most European countries in terms of uh, cases, hospitalizations, and mortality. But speaking of the UK, looking at some preliminary figures published by the Office of National Statistics, in January, there were, on January 19th, 1,372 COVID deaths. By the week of April 16th, the average death rate was 29, compared to the average rate of 80 for the flu between 2015 and 2019. What happened between January and April? The government unveiled a very successful vaccination strategy. That has clearly not been the case in Canada. Can the honorable members speak to that? And how, in the face of such statistics, can she possibly criticize Premier Kennedy without uttering one word of criticism for the prime minister and his total failure when it comes to vaccinations? The honorable member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I. I have to say that the UK initially made a lot of mistakes. And when Prime Minister Boris Johnson himself came down with COVID, up till that point, they had been they had not been moving as quickly and as hard as they have done recently, which is why they were able to deal with variants. And the, the variants in particular are quite terrifying. I have lots of criticisms to go around on all sides. And I, I even hate the, the partisanship of focusing on only one province right now. I think our bigger problem is fractured federation, not being clear on how we can 
work together. If we're not using the Emergencies Act, and I, as I said to my honorable colleague um, from um, St. Albert, Edmonton, I don't intend to not criticize <laughs> the federal government. There's mistakes have been made everywhere. But the, the more we can approach this in a nonpartisan fashion, the more we have a chance of being Team Canada and getting through this with minimal loss of life now that we're in a third wave that's quite terrible.